evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Teaching Hemingway, a professional development webinar sponsored by the National Humanities Center's America in Class. I'm Richard Schramm. I'm the Vice President for Education Programs at the Center, and I'll be moderating this evening's session. And I want to thank all of you who were with us last week when we experienced technical difficulties that prevented us from having the seminar. Uh, those of you who stayed with us, I want to thank you for joining us again tonight. And I promise you we're going to give you a really good, the really good seminar you would have gotten last week. Thanks again for staying with us. Before we get underway, let me just introduce the Humanities Center and America in Class to you. The Center, which sponsors America in Class, is located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. It is the country's only independent institute for advanced study in all branches of the humanities. The primary program we offer at the Center is a fellowship program that brings scholars to the Center from this country and abroad to research and write on topics in, in the humanities, literature, language studies, America, history, uh, philosophy, criticism of the arts, that sort of thing. Our job in the education programs and in America in class is to bring their expertise to you folks, you teachers out there in American history and literature. You've already discovered our webinars, but if you want to find out all of the other resources and programs we offer for teachers, go to americainclass.org and you will discover all of those things. It will land you on this page, and from this page you can gain access to everything the center does for teachers. You can also find out what we do by going to our Pinterest page. There we aggregate all of the products we offer along with the products that other people offer. We offer some really interesting uh, material that you can use on different topics in teaching American history and literature. Stay abreast of what we do by finding us on Facebook. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to announce something new from the National Humanities Center. A monthly newsletter from America in class that will keep you up to date on our webinars and more particularly on our lessons. We are producing uh, many, many more uh, interactive lessons for teaching of American history and literature and our new newsletter, which you'll be receiving shortly. Uh, we hope you stay with us. We'll tell you about those lessons in addition to giving you information about the general life of the center and the state of the humanities in the United States. So please watch for that. A new newsletter from the National Humanities Center from the education programs at the center. Now, after our program is over this evening, please go back to the Teaching Hemingway uh, webpage. There you will find a recording of the program and you will also find the PowerPoint. As always, feel free to plunder that PowerPoint, take it back into your classes and use it for your teaching. That's what it's there for. You will find an evaluation. Fill that out, please, and submit it to us. And once we receive that, you will be able to download a certificate documenting your participation to submit to your local certifying authority to obtain whatever recertification credit your participation warrants. Now, how do you participate? For those of you who are new, our seminar leader this evening, Sean McCann, will be lecturing and he will be stopping from time to time to examine particular passages from Hemingway's stories. We'll ask some discussion questions. And we really urge you to answer those questions. Join with us. And the way to, to respond is to put your cursor in that long, narrow box down at the lower right-hand corner of your screen. You see I bracketed it there. Um, type your response. Hit that send button. It'll come up to the... Uh, to the uh, uh, chat box above, and as the moderator, I'll be bringing that into the conversation all night long at the opportune moment. But don't wait for us to ask a question. Please, if you have a question or if you have a comment to make, put it up there. I'll bring that into the conversation as best I can. The golden, the golden rule of our webinars is that the more you participate, the better the webinar. So let's get underway. Our webinar leader this evening is Sean McCann, a professor of English at Wesleyan University who is a fellow of the National Humanities Center. In 2000, he published Gunshoe America, Hard-Boiled Crime Fiction and the Rise and Fall of New Deal Liberalism. And in 2008, he published a book that is particularly germane in 2016, A Pinnacle of Feeling, American Literature and Presidential Government. So let me turn the program over to Sean. Sean. Tell us why we should still read and teach Ernest Hemingway. Okay, um, I'll be glad to. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, thank you all for being here, um, and thank you for your patience. Um, uh, just so you know, uh, I am speaking to you from the other side of the globe. I'm in Singapore at the moment, where it's uh, just past 8 o'clock in the morning, so um, it's a kind of technical marvel uh, that we're having this conversation. 
Because I noticed you're speaking up. I noticed you're speaking up really loudly, Sean, so that we can hear you on this side of the world. I, I, I thank you for that. Oh, good. Okay, so maybe I should yell a little bit less loudly. Now, don't, don't, no, don't blow your voice. That's fine. Just kidding. Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, why should we care about Hemingway? Um, uh, that's the big question. It, uh, in my view, has virtually nothing to do with um, the presidency or presidential government. Thank goodness. Um, so we could be talking about something entirely different. Um, but this is, of course, the big question. And um, if you're working with students, they may well ask, why do we care about this person? Why should we care about this person? Um, and they may have strong reasons for not wanting to care about him at all. Uh, so uh, I guess what I would say is, uh, in my view, there are three big reasons um, why uh, students today should continue to take some interest in Hemingway. One, um, you might kind of might call a kind of uh, historical or scholarly interest. That is, we can um, look at Hemingway as a person who formulated a, a truly robust and distinctive uh, philosophy of art and its relationship to experience uh, that was in some ways really exemplary of a, a wide range of the ideas that artists had in the early part of the 20th century. So Hemingway is quite representative of, a, of an influential generation of artists, um, many of whom look quite unlike him in some ways. He's also his own distinctive um, thinker and writer uh, and is worth attending to in that way. We can, um, of course, have a kind of literary and aesthetic interest in him for just what he does with the elements of narrative fiction, um, um, things that are remarkably innovative and quite striking and resonant and that will matter to a lot of other writers. And finally, um, and maybe most um, importantly for many of us, um, we might take an interest in him because uh, he's an incredibly teachable writer, um, and teachable not just in the sense that his stories work well in the classroom, but that they work especially well to bring strikingly to students' attentions the kinds of things that uh, teachers of literature want them to be aware of, uh, the value of careful attention to the details of literary craftsmanship, the rewards of reading carefully and closely. This is something that uh, Hemingway uh, and some other writers like him are almost uniquely suited to bring to mind. It's a, a kind of um, dirty little secret of literary modernism, perhaps, that despite the fact that many of these writers have a strong anti-academic bias, uh, they are really suited to the classroom. Why is this? Um, in short, because uh, they demand uh, and invite us to become leaders like themselves and tell us uh, that we are important. Uh, and un unusual in being able to do so. So let me try and be um, more specific about this, but let me first say uh, all of this is different from the way in which Hemingway was taught to a person of my generation and uh, for the reputation that is still prominently associated with him today. Um, this is the vision of Hemingway as an artist of machismo um, and as a, uh, in the in the most common representation of this way of thinking as the person who gave us the code hero, uh, the narrative celebration of the strong man who survives in a valueless world, who has values in a valueless world. Um, this was a, a view that was remarkably well suited to the prevailing currents of intellectual thinking in the mid 20th century, um, of academic existentialism in particular. And importantly, I, it's not that it is not uh, a way of thinking, not that I'm going to do a triple negative here. It's not that it's not a way of thinking that's not germane to Hemingway. Um, it certainly is. That, that is, this is a vision that he worked quite hard to create um, in the popular media, uh, as well as in uh, his memoirs and in his writing more generally. And that accurately captures some of the things that he cared about, even if it doesn't necessarily accurately reflect who he was as a person. Um, so it, it, this this um, vision is important to understanding who he is, but uh, it's only partially related to the reasons uh, that he became such an important writer to begin with. So uh, it's quite likely that if you are teaching Hemingway, your students will um, say, I just do not like this person, and I do not care for the things that he presents to me and the vision of the world uh, that he represents. 
to which I think it might be fair to say, okay, um, that's a, a quite reasonable reaction. Um, you are seeing what is there, um, but you should also be aware of the qualities that, um, sorry, uh, you should also be aware of the qualities that made him important to writers of his generation, some of whom, many of whom did not share these values at all. Sean, so Sean, if, if, Sean if, I, if I could just interrupt here for a moment, please. It might be worthwhile to ask our teachers how their students respond to Hemingway, and do they find Hemingway eminently teachable? Do, their, do, do your students, folks, um, find him at all relevant to their lives? Do they enjoy reading Hemingway? Well, while Sean proceeds with his introductory remarks here, let us hear from you, and let us hear about your teaching experience with Hemingway. Sorry to interrupt there, Sean. Let, let's go ahead. Okay, no problem. So, um, I just to, to make this uh, point concrete, that is the point that even people who don't much like Hemingway as a person uh, and don't much like what he seems to stand for as a writer, nevertheless often um, admire him quite deeply. And uh, in this respect, his influence just cannot be, uh, it, it cannot be said strongly enough. Uh, probably with the possible exceptions of Joyce and Eliot and maybe in a different way Gertrude Stein, Nobody of his generation has anything like the impact that he does on his contemporaries and successors. Uh, among the people, uh, and I hope this list, which is very, very far from complete, I, I hope this list will give a sense of some of the diversity of kinds of writers who might appreciate him. Uh, Joyce himself, Eliot himself, uh, and by the way, um, if you haven't heard, uh, Hemingway, uh, he could be extremely uh, nasty and mean-spirited as a writer. He had terrible, terrible things to say about Eliot in private and in public. Uh, and Eliot himself was philosophically in some ways quite unlike Hemingway. Did not prevent him from thinking that Hemingway was a great writer. Uh, this was true also of Wallace Stevens, Ilya Ehrenberg, Frank O'Connor, uh, Sean O'Fallon, Elizabeth Bowen, Dorothy Parker, Evelyn Wow, uh, and the list can be extended. So all sorts of people who you might look at and say, very few of these are like it, the other. Uh, all recognize that Hemingway is a great writer, and and so is the case for a, a subsequent generation. Uh, Sean, if I may, may, may interrupt again, you you segue beautifully into a comment from one of our participants who was responding to my question about how the students respond. He writes, "It depends on the work. My kids really seem to like Macomber and Snows of Kilimanjaro, and when we study him in relation to F. Scott Fitzgerald, it's always lively, and they get the idea of frenemies." Yeah, um, <laughs> that is appropriate. Uh, yeah. Some of the, the frenemying was all being done on Hemingway's side, I think. Um, Fitzgerald was um, slavish in his admiration for Hemingway, and Hemingway yeah. was ruthless in his devastation of Fitzgerald. Yeah. And you know, another, another writer you could add to this list, we just finished a series on war fiction, and the, the last um, novel we looked at was The Things They Carry by Tim O'Brien, and I would add him to the list of subsequent generations. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think probably there's um, hardly anybody. Um, oh, I can see that I'm not being loud enough here. Let me see if I can um, speak more clearly. Okay, if if that's a problem, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm I'm hearing Sean Fine. Others seem to be. I would turn up the uh, volume on your computers. Try that, and uh, we'll see what happens. But let's uh, let's. Um, okay, other people are having the problem too. So if you could turn up. The volume on your computers, that might work. And Sean, if you could ratchet up your microphone volume, maybe we'll, we'll solve okay. that problem. Folks, forget he's, don't forget, he's in Singapore. <laughs> yeah. All right, tell me if I'm not being loud or if I'm being too loud. If I'm bursting your eardrums, let me know. And meantime, I will try and um, speak very loud. All right, so, there, uh, there we go, Sean. You're doing it well. Okay. So all of these writers, uh, people who you would look at and think, Oh, I didn't expect them. I did not expect Anne Beatty to say that she liked Ernest Hemingway. Uh, I didn't expect Toni Morrison or Nadine Gordimer, um, John Updike, Derek Walcott. Uh, all of these people admire him. So uh, why? Why do they admire him? Um, well, one thing to note, um, I'll come back to that in just a second, but one thing to note is that the influence is not merely personal. Um, it's, you might say, programmatic, uh, curricular, institutional. As the uh, Stanford literary scholar Mark McGraw has pointed out in a, a currently very um, prominent book in uh, academic scholarship, The Program Era, 
Uh, Hemingway was one of the key figures in the institutionalization of literary modernism by way of the MFA program. Of course, as we're all uh, aware at some level, uh, the MFA is a major part of our literary world. Hardly anybody now becomes a prominent writer of literary fiction or poetry or drama who has not first, and first gotten an MFA at some uh, institution of higher education, the most famous being Iowa, of course. Uh, the great era uh, when the MFA program becomes a dominant institution of literary culture is in the decades after World War II. And one way to understand this is not simply that the university becomes the most important patron of uh, serious literary expression or something like, um, in baseball terms, the farm system of literary publishing, uh, but in doing so, that it institutionalizes the values of literary modernism. That is, concerns about literary expression uh, and techniques in literary style and attitudes towards literary art that were once avant-garde, bohemian, limited to coterie audiences primarily become part of mass culture uh, by way of the mediation of the university. And uh, when that happens, uh, MFA programs look to uh, founding figures or they look to um, saints for their canon. Uh, Eliot is one of them, uh, Joyce in a lesser way, Hemingway and Henry James uh, in fiction are probably the most predominant figures. Uh, what they're good for is establishing a kind of consensus about attitudes towards literary art uh, and a sense about what the key problems of literary art are, uh, most especially the balance among a craft and experience uh, and sometimes voice and a concern with literary technique. In particular, uh, the emphasis on structure, on the idea that all fiction is in some ways commenting on the writing of fiction and most importantly, an obsession with point of view. If there's one thing that the MFA program tells people to care about intensely, it's point of view, point of view, point of view. And Hemingway is the guy who helps to make this all make sense. In this John, way, uh, interestingly, yep. Uh, if, go ahead, make your point, and then uh, give me a chance. I want to interrupt you again. So please make your point. Okay. Uh, small point, just that. Uh, he is aligned in this respect with James and Eliot, uh, despite the fact that uh, he disliked both of them intensely. So in some ways, there's a deeper ideological sy sympathy than uh, personal difference. We have a really good question in the chat, but we also have a comment that I must say is one of the most interesting comments I've encountered in all of my years doing these webinars. Karen B. writes, I teach in remote Alaskan villages and the district powers always want us to teach the old man in the sea, which the students hate. Instead, they like and identify with the sun also rises. Now, Sean, did you ever guess that the sun also rises with resonate with kids in, in Alaskan villages and the close quarters of a community and hierarchy and competing codes? You, uh, I, the I the power of literature to connect. I, I wouldn't have guessed that, but uh, I admire their taste, I guess. Um, I think the sun also rises is a, is a vastly better novel um, than uh, The Old Man of the Sea. And, and Karen writes, they are Yupik and uh, Inupiat kids. Now, Karen, are those, are, I've never been to Alaska, are, I, are those towns near the coast? I mean, are, are, are you involved, are, are you and your students involved with the sea? Um, uh, Karen is responding. Um, let's see what her answer is. Yes, Sean, that's astonishing that the kids respond to the, uh, the sun also rises, a, a continental, you know, Paris, um, uh, uh, Spain, a uh, very European, very sun-drenched, very urban novel. And here we have students in remote rural Alaskan villages right by the ocean identifying with that more than the old man in the sea. That's, that's astonishing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now, our question... What might Hemingway have thought about the proliferation of MFA programs? Yeah, I'm sure he would have scorned them um, as he scorned many of the institutions that were important to his success. Uh, and this turns out to be a good recipe for success for Hemingway's, uh, writers of Hemingway's generation. 
Mm -hmm. It's the best way to prosper uh, in a mass cultural world and to prosper as a figure of mass culture is to act as if you have disdain for it. Um, mm -hmm. Disdain is genuine, I think, um, but it's also a very useful strategy for thriving in this world. And so it worked out very well for Hemingway. There's nothing like putting up a velvet rope in front of something to make people really want to get into it. And that's one mm -hmm. of the things that Hemingway does for himself and for literature in general. That's right. So, he um, he presented himself. He, he presented himself. If I may, he presented himself as an anti-intellectual, and yet he had an astonishingly large library that he really used. And if you notice in his stories and in his um, his memoirs, you've always got books trailing him along. He was this he was this anti-intellectual who just so happened to absorb the philosophy of the early twentieth century and you know recreate. Uh, English prose, some anti-intellectual. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's uh, the story, I think, indeed. Um, it's typical in some ways of this generation of writers, um, that it's also very Hemingway in particular. Um, so what is it a, about him that helps to account for his suitability to the program era and his influence on writers and readers more generally? Well, the thing that people will usually say, if pressed on this, that, that artists will say, uh, is that Hemingway exemplifies for him a devotion to craft. Uh, here's Henley Lewis Gates Jr. giving us the, the capsule version. It is the integrity of Hemingway's craft that will endure forever. And Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, Hemingway, the one who had most to do with my craft, his astounding knowledge of the aspect of craftsmanship. Uh, and these are versions of sentiments that are repeated often about Hemingway uh, then and now, and that Hemingway himself cared about a great deal. So here he is writing to Maxwell Perkins in 25, at the very beginning of his remarkable meteoric um, journey to literary fame, saying, the stories are written so tight and so hard that the alteration of a word can throw an entire story out of key. So uh, what is this? What is, what is craft? Why do people care about craft? Well, of course, um, in the simplest sense, we might say uh, it refers to um, skill in literary construction, caring about the way a text is put together, working very hard to make it come out as successfully as possible. But I don't think that captures the full allure of the word, the reason it has a kind of glow around it for literary artists. Why does it have that glow? I think um, because, in effect, it is a professional ethos. That is, it says, uh, it celebrates, it recognizes and celebrates the distinctive trained ability of specialists, artists, literary artists who have devoted their life to honing their expertise at something that they are very good at. The idea that they have a commitment to this, that the commitment is valuable, admirable, that it gives them a kind of special insight, this is all celebrated in the idea of craftsmanship. It becomes uh, elaborated in Hemingway's fiction into a kind of artistic philosophy, a kind of radical version of Ars Longa Vita Brevis, that is, um, art lives, life is short, art endures. And this is, um, in one respect, the great theme of much of his great writing. Probably, uh, if you ask any person on the street about what Hemingway is about, or if you ask your students about it, they'll say it's about machismo. Um, it's about machismo, or it's about existentialism, values in a valueless world, etc. Um, but if you ask writers what it's about, they'll say it's about craft. Um, and if you think more closely about the stories, you'll see again and again this kind of ars longa vita brevis theme expressed. That is, bodies fail, people die, bodies rot, they fall apart, they get broken. Uh, but literary craftsmanship, the implication is leads to something enduring. And this is expressed in a kind of programmatic way in Snows of Kilimanjaro um, in another country as well. If you think about the contrast that is set up there between the broken bodies of those veterans and the silly machines that are working to fix them. And by contrast, the emphasis say on the study of grammar uh, that the major uh, is passing on to the narrator in his comments on Italian. You see an implication that runs all through Hemingway's fiction, that, it, that is, there is a devotion to the technique and form of language and literary art that is more enduring than the vulnerability of bodies. Uh, in fact, 
for a writer who is renowned for his machismo, one of the striking things about Hemingway is how frequently he is depicting his heroes as hurtable, as injured, as damaged, as vulnerable in some way. Um, this is consistent with the machismo, that is, real men get hurt in his world, um, but it's also part of this ethos that what truly matters is your devotion to making a text that is superior to the vulnerability of a human body. And uh, this uh, is consistent also, also with a kind of ethical drama running all through his fiction about the dialectic of art and life, you might say, in highfalutin terms. That is, the idea that experience is not meaningful for us uh, and it has no um, permanence unless it is given some kind of shape by literary craftsmanship and vice versa, that literary craftsmanship has no meaning or purpose unless it has some origin in experience. And these things must always be related to each other in some way and can always go wrong. Um, more importantly, perhaps, this leads to a, a series of literary techniques uh, and of strikingly innovative experiments in um, literary style. Uh, in some ways, it's now, the, the innovations are so influential that in some ways it is now hard to see how dramatic they were when they were first created, but Hemingway is doing things with narrative fiction that his contemporaries are just bowled over by. Um, the, to put them in shorthand, these are the techniques that are evident in the obvious features of his style, the striking objectivity, to which we will return in a second, uh, the simplicity of syntax and diction, uh, and the heavy emphasis on omission, on not including important information, of course. None of this, or very, very little of this, is totally unprecedented. In fact, one way we can understand Hemingway is to see him as extending a trajectory of innovation that is begun by a, a, an immediately preceding generation of artists, exemplified by Henry James, uh, Conrad, Ford Maddox Ford, Stephen Crane, Maupassant, um, all of whom Hemingway reads, uh, several of whom he explicitly admires a great deal, and whose lessons he absorbs. Um, so studies at the feet of Ezra Pound, who is in some ways his most important early champion, who teaches Hemingway about the values of compression and montage, and Gertrude Stein, uh, who teaches him about um, simplicity of diction and of the aesthetic power of repetition. But Hemingway, he kind of combines all of these things. Uh, he brings the impressionist trajectory to a more extreme extent, uh, and he turns the techniques of his mentors into a new narrative language. I, I would say, personally, that um, he takes lessons that he's taught by Pound and Stein, uh, who are, in some respects, philosophically more radical than he is, uh, and he turns them into uh, techniques for psychological realism. Neither Pound nor Gertrude Stein are much interested in what narrative fiction traditionally conveys, a view of character psychological realism and humanist philosophy, say. Hemingway takes what they teach him and he uses it to give us character, to engage us in psychological realism. And this makes for a very powerful language of fiction. So Sean, Sean, could we say that, if, if, I may, if I may, can we say that Hemingway took the modernist sensibilities of um, um, Pound and um, uh, Gertrude Stein and grafted them on to more traditional, the more traditional purposes of fiction? Would that be fair to say? Yeah, I would say exactly that. Yes, I would say exactly uh -huh. that. I think he's not, uh, although he moves in avant-garde circles, he is not himself an avant-gardist in, in the sense yeah. that an avant-gardist might be hostile to the idea of character or to the idea of the autonomous person or of literature and expressing yeah. and representing the feelings and thoughts of the autonomous person. Stein and Pound don't really care about that much at all. Yeah. So really, um, literary modernism, would it be safe to say literary modernism was introduced into the United States by Hemingway? Made popular? Not Hemingway alone. Um, uh, not, no? I would say not Hemingway alone, but I, I think his role in popularizing it. Uh, he has allies like Fitzgerald, uh, like Edmund Wilson, mm -hmm. like T.S. Eliot. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. in, oh, right, right. I think probably very few, nobody is more important than he is. Um, the Sun Also Rises right, is probably right. the first really important vector for this. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, well Fitzgerald um, had his popular, 
uh, Fitzgerald had his popular audience. Eliot um, had he wasn't you know as popular as as uh, as Hemingway to be sure. So I, I I would say those two Fitzgerald and Hemingway probably in terms of fiction at any rate introduced um, modernism into uh, to the American uh, main the cultural mainstream. Yep, That'd be fair absolutely. to say. Yep. Yes, okay. I think so. Yeah, I think absolutely. All right. So uh, okay. well, if we let's... think about a later story, um, if we think about a later story like Snows of Kilimanjaro, which um, might be uh, something that your students know or that they're interested in, you can see the ethos of craft uh, retrospectively codified. What I mean by this is this is a story late in Hemingway's life, and he's already turned this into a kind of philosophy um, that, he is, that he feels comfortable expressing in a very programmatic way but that is less ex expressly um, suggested in the earlier fiction. So let's just take a, a quick look at this. Among the things to note about this uh, uh, is simply where it was published in Esquire, um, so that you can see already that Hemingway has brought his own life successfully into the worlds of mass publication. And of course, there is a great paradox in this. Uh, it is the, the genuine paradox of literary modernism in mass culture. It sells very well. Here he is giving us a story about the horror of selling out, which sells very well in a mass circulation magazine. So uh, here's poor Harry rotting away from gangrene uh, in Africa, um, asking himself the question, why should he blame this woman because she kept him well? He had destroyed his talent by not using it, by betrayals of himself and what he believed in, by drinking so much that he blunted the edge of his perceptions by laziness, by sloth, and by snobbery, by pride, and by prejudice, by hook, and by crook. What was this? A catalog of old books? What was his talent anyway? It was a talent, all right, but instead of using it, he had traded on it. It was never what he had done, but what he could do, and he had chosen to make his living with something else instead of a pen or a pencil. He had sold vitality in one form or another, or another all his life. And now this life that she had built again was coming to a term because he had not used iodine two weeks ago when a thorn had scratched his knee as they moved forward trying to photograph a herd of water bucks standing, their heads up, peering while their nostrils searched the air, their ears spread wide to hear the first noise that would send them rushing into the bush. They had bolted to before he got the picture. So, uh, as I say, um, to me, this seems like the, the craft ethos put in allegorical form, codified for us as a kind of philosophy. Um, and uh, its implications are, I think, pretty striking and fairly clear. Um, uh, again, bodies rot, um, vitality can be sold. Uh, true literary art resists this by giving us something enduring. So, uh, this raises. Um, uh, some interesting questions, I think. Um, one question that which I haven't put here, but you might ask is, um, he had chosen to make his living with something else instead of a pen or a pencil. Uh, any thoughts on what Hemingway uh, is kind of nastily suggesting here? Okay. <clears throat> any any thoughts on what Hemingway is suggesting when he says he has chosen to make his living with something else instead of a pen or a pencil? We have a number of people typing in. Um, let's see what we have here uh, to say. But you, our, our, our discussion about Hemingway entering popular culture reminded me that um, the, uh, the day he died, my family uh, was coming back from a uh, picnic. My father, we were driving back, my father, the radio on, and on the, radio, the news came on and it announced that Ernest Hemingway had died. And my parents, who weren't particularly literary people, stopped and paid attention. And I was, who was like 11 years old. Even I paid attention to the point that I still remember it today. Okay, Susan writes, maybe he is suggesting that writing is one of the most respected ways to make a living. All right. I oh, think yes. perhaps... Yeah. I, Go ahead. I think he's certainly suggesting that. Of course, he's suggesting um, that he is... Uh, appealing to his wife because he has established a reputation as a literary mm -hmm. artist. Absolutely. And he, yeah. he had a ma Hemingway himself had a mass cultural reputation, which uh, he was not reluctant to trade on. Um, for a long time, uh, literary scholars paid no attention to this. 
And only recently have people noticed things like the fact that, say, Hemingway was selling Ballantine Ale in the 1950s, um, that he had a, a presence in the very mass advertising, mass circulation magazines, et cetera, that he scorned, and where his scorn was a, a useful selling tool. I was actually going to bring that up. I saw that ad in a Life magazine. Yeah. And I, would, I, I kick myself now for not having bought it. So what, what maybe he, what he is saying here that he chosen to make, he's chosen to make his living with something else instead of a pen or a pencil is that he has chosen to make his living through imagery, through the, the, the image of quote unquote Ernest Hemingway. Yeah, I, I am sure that he is saying that, but I think that he's saying something a little more nasty as well. <laughs> and, and one thing to, to note about him is just that he, Part of his power as a writer, that's one reason why people are provoked by him, is that he is a nasty writer. He is not afraid to say mean things. In the story, of course, Harry's own power as a figure hinges on the fact that he will say terribly mean things to the woman who loves him yeah. um, and who is attempting to care for him, which seems like a, a mark of honesty. In, in this particular case, I think he's suggesting he made his living as a gigolo. Um, that he's oh. something other than a pen or a pencil is a penis, um, yeah. and that is selling vitality instead of producing it. So, yeah, a, a truly uh, ugly kind of um, suggestion here, but consistent with the whole philosophy of art. Um, that helps, I, I think, to clarify why, or might help to clarify, why this cause of death in particular. That is, why gangrene? Uh, well. His flesh is rotting. This is the condition of all flesh, I think, in many ways, is implying to us it rots. Um, but then there's the more significant detail, perhaps, of the fact that the gangrene is the result of a thorn that scratched his knee uh, as he's moving forward trying to photograph a herd of water buck. I think for Hemingway, this is all resonant. That is, the fact that it is a thorn, the fact that he's a photographer, um, none of that looks good in Hemingway's mm -hmm. uh, way of thinking about things, I believe. So any thoughts about why this particular cause of uh, sickness and death? Okay, any comments on that? Why this particular cause of sickness and death? We have some folks typing in. Karen B. writes, slow gradual death brought on by neglect, among other things, not taking the warning signs. Seriously, neglect, yeah, I think that's, that's the key word there. He's neglected his talent and he's neglected his health. We have some other folks yeah. typing in. Let's see. The rotting flesh um, yeah. art. Um, it's something so simple that becomes so powerful. He could have taken care of the thing so easily early on. Uh, we have other folks typing in. Let's see what they have to say. I agree, Ernst. Okay, we have some other things. It also seems quite random, Sean. I mean, this is just a... You know, this is this is a getting back to literary naturalism. It just this just happens. It's nature and, and it's it's fate and bad luck. You know, I agree with Karen and Ernst. It's a, a Jennifer. It's also pointless. What do you make of those responses, Sean? Yeah, that all seems right to me. Um, and that is, of course, Hemingway. That the the world is full of random violence. Uh, Flesh rots, bodies fail, uh, artists are destroyed. Um, responding to this with some kind of dignity rather than cravenly struggling to survive, I think is Hemingway's sense of what a person should do, of course. And it's one reason why he seems um, so attractive to a kind of mid-century existentialism. This is the value, value in the valueless world business. I would just add to that but I think the, the further implication is the thorn scratching his knee is Harry being written on rather than writing. That is, he's not using a pen and pencil to turn his experience into art. The experience is writing on his body, literally scratching into his flesh, almost as in a, in a Kafka story. Um, if you know in the penal colony, you know that there's that Kafka story about uh, how the body is literally inscribed by a machine. Hemingway is, I think, yes, right, Karen notes it. Yeah, Hemingway is suggesting the same thing, I think, here. Um, this is what happens to artists who sell themselves out. They get written on rather than writing. And if, and of course, well, Teresa, is Teresa, Teresa, writer, right? Right. Teresa notes that there is some choice in this, though. I mean, he he's um, yep. chosen to be out there on a photo, 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 photographic uh, safari, and yep. he chose to take care of the wounds. Right. 
Yes, exactly. Uh, um, and this is uh, the moral failure that the story is about. Uh, the moral uh -huh. failure is selling your talent, um, being a photographer rather than a writer. Uh, to the extent there is a moral victory in the end, it is in ceasing to care about these things and in therefore being a, a, a mean-spirited son of a bitch as you're going out the door, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But uh, that's, I think, all of the, the suggestion. Well, what about the notion that he's a photographer here and not a hunter? The the woman, the, the his wife here, goes out and hunts, and she's a good hunter. She brings back food. He's not photo. He's not hunting. He's out there with a camera as opposed to a gun. What does that tell us? Yeah, I think this is consistent with this. That is, uh, Hemingway is going to suggest often that there are analogies for literary craftsmanship uh, that involve the encounter with mortality. Um, bodies rot. Experience is fragile. Uh, True art is a heroic encounter with these things. Therefore, bullfighting and hunting can look like writing. I think mm -hmm. photography, mm -hmm. by contrast, does not look like writing. It looks yeah. like mere recording uh, and uh, therefore a kind of sellout. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing okay. that I would note about this passage is that uh, if, you were to, if, if you were not to know this story, um, and if you were just to read these sentences, uh, you would not necessarily know this was Hemingway. This is not the Hemingway style that made Hemingway famous. Uh, just note, say, some of the um, syntax and the word choice. Uh, one thing you'll see here is that uh, there is subordination. There are complex sentences. Um, you will see that there is very uh, distinctive word choice. Uh, excuse me. Uh, their heads are peering uh, of the, um, the water buck. Uh, they're mm -hmm. sent rushing into the bush. They had bolted. These are all the kinds of words. A thorn scratching the knee. Um, these are the kinds of words that any careful writer might use, but that the young Hemingway probably would not have used. So even mm -hmm. though he's kind of codifying his vision here, he has already left far behind the style that gave rise to that vision in the first place. Mm -hmm. And we have some comments here. Teresa uh, echoes your comment about he's not writing. She writes, in addition, those are passive activities of photography, whereas act writing is active. Um, Ernst summarizes this in those, uh, those men who can hunt, those who can't take pictures. Right. Uh, Susan writes, photography is also, this is a really good point, voyeuristic, whereas white writing is really living. And let's see. Uh, Ernst asks, would you be willing to comment on the overall structure of Snows, how that fits in with all of this? What about the overall structure? Can you say briefly a few words about that? We have about 45 minutes. Yeah, I think so. Um, though, if I remember right, Ernst is not Ernst. Ernst is Denise, maybe? Or I think I saw another name earlier. Um, <laughs> no. uh, yeah, Denise. I, uh, yeah, it's a great question. Okay, I, all right. Okay. If I, I think what Denise is getting at is the way there is, um, it can, in keeping with the larger dialectic of art and life that Hemingway is so obsessed about, there is the dialectic in the story between uh, Harry's memories uh, and uh, the diegetic interaction between Harry and his wife. So we have the public world of dialogue and we have the private world of experience, that which has not been preserved by Harry carefully in writing, but which the story nevertheless gives us access to. Mm -hmm. And I would say there again, you kind of get in an allegorical way uh, the philosophy that is at the core of Hemingway's writing, but that he wouldn't have given us allegorically earlier. Um, interestingly, uh, the story is, and different people will have different tastes about this, but the story is about decadence. Um, and if you are a, a, an unsympathetic reader might say it's the kind of decadent Hemingway as well. He's lost or he's no longer practicing what made him the writer who he became. Mm -hmm. I appreciate what I appreciate what Denise is doing here. She's bunburying in a reference to the importance of being earnest by Oscar Wilde. Very good, Denise. You're obviously an English teacher. Good for you. So um, oh, if this is the decadent Hemingway, um, let's look at uh, the classical Hemingway, the, the early Hemingway that he's, the Hemingway himself is drawing on. In this story, Harry draws on his experience or kind of recalls the experience that he didn't write, thinking, I will never write this now. Uh, and we can look at the early Hemingway that informed this fiction. So um, let's look at uh, In Another Country. 
which um, Hemingway wrote as a very young person, one of the remarkable things about him is how quickly he moved from a kind of apprentice uh, stage into full-blown artistic maturity at a very, very young age. Uh, he's, I think, 23 or 24 when he writes the story. So it is about a young person, uh, but it's also amazingly written by a young person. And uh, again, it, it it just blew some of his contemporaries uh, and later writers away. Fitzgerald in particular said about the opening sentence of the story, it's one of the most beautiful prose sentences I've ever read. Uh, Wallace Stevens said more generally about Hemingway's writing uh, uh, collectively, uh, that he was really a lyric poet as opposed to a fiction writer. Uh, Frank O'Connor said about the whole opening paragraph of the story that it was like watching an old magician. Uh, O'Connor did not like Hemingway, by the way. Um, so this is a reluctant admiration. So uh, if we were just to look at the sentence, um, what's your thought about why Fitzgerald thinks it's one of the most beautiful prose sentences ever written? Uh, in the fall, the war was always there, but we did not go to it anymore. Why, hey, is, that why so is What do you think? Okay, why is that so striking? Any, any comments? I've always admired that sense. I've always admired the beginning of this story. Uh, we have some folks typing in. Let's see what the responses are. Um, the way he... Well, I, I don't, I don't want to go on with what I want to say, because I want to hear what other people have to say. There we go. It's so simple, yet it says so much. Brilliantly put, yeah. Sega. Yes, very well. Okay. There you go. Yeah. I like the way he creates... He, in just a few words, he, he, he embodies, the, I mean, when I say embody, I mean, he gives the war presence and flesh. It's like, it's like, like a, an elemental force. It's always there. Um, yeah. and, and yet we don't go to it. We, we, we're, we're walking away from it. Um, speaks to the emotional loss, sense of purposes of the lost generation. Yes, it does. It does, I think, speak to that sense of uh, desolation that the lost generation felt. Um, but it's yeah. such a, a perfectly well balanced sentence, and it's so striking. We don't go to it. it you know, it, the war is a physical presence that we're not going to pay any attention. It's almost like ignoring the ocean, you know. Um, yes, exactly. Yeah. For instance, uh, I think that's Bunbury. Exactly. Yeah, ah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Bunbury writes. Uh, I bet Tim O'Brien likes it too. Yeah. So uh, how do you how do you judge those responses, uh, uh, Sean? I think that's exactly right. Um, uh, I think all of that intimation uh, about uh, loss and about the idea that there's much more to be felt than in the, that is expressed in the sentence, that that is all part of its great success. I also agree with you, Richard, that uh, part of what's striking about this uh, sentence is its unusual balance. That is, it looks almost like an 18th century sentence, a kind of uh, the period, the, the balanced period, two independent clauses joined by a comma and a but. Uh, and where you get this uh, contrast between the war and the individuals, where the war is the subject in the first part and the we is the subject in the second part. So you have the sense of the contrast between the enormity uh, of the war uh, mm -hmm. and the tininess of the people and perhaps the illusion that they may have about agency as we do not go to it. Um, yeah. And this, of course, means they're out of the war, they're, they're, they're no longer in combat, but it possibly also implies that uh, there's an illusion of their control over things when, of course, the big fact is the war. And right. its bigness is created in part simply by the way in which Hemingway refers to it in unusual terms. He doesn't say, in the fall, everyone was talking about the war, or in the, floor, in the wall, fighting was always in the news, or anything of that sort. It's... Uh, the war is this enormous presence. It is simply there on the horizon. Well, Jennifer, Jennifer um, agrees with that. It's having something terrible in a continuous basis and just resigning yourself to its presence but not paying it, any attention to it uh, anymore. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Excellent. Or thinking you're not paying attention. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so um, we can extend this kind of attention to um, the whole first paragraph. Um, and let me just ask you, note, this is the paragraph that O'Connor marvels uh, over, and, and let's just consider uh, not only the thematic intimations of the paragraph, although we certainly should, but before we get to that, that is, before we get to what it's about, or what it's conveying, or what emotion it's establishing, before we get to that, let's just note the technique 
um, which is uh, in its day so unusual that it just makes jaws drop, uh, and which is uh, so bizarre even still that it, well, one thing you can do to bring this out is you can ask your students to imitate Hemingway. Um, I've often asked students to do something like this, and I think what you usually discover 9.9 .9 times out of 10 is that they can't do it. Um, they think they can do it by, um, by writing about some, something that involves war or machismo, um, but typically the imitations are very pale because it's so difficult to bring yourself to write in this way. And of course, no English teacher would actually recommend it. So what do I mean by this? Well, let's just look at this paragraph. Um, in the fall, the war was always there, but we did not go to it anymore. It was cold in the fall in Milan, and the dark came very early. Then the electric lights came on, and it was pleasant along the streets looking in the windows. There was much game hanging outside the shops, and the snow powdered in the fur of the foxes, and the wind blew their tails. The deer hung stiff and heavy and empty, and small birds blew in the wind, and the wind turned their feathers. It was a cold fall, and the wind came down from the mountains. The, to me, this is, uh, it's a, the sentences are beautiful, the paragraph is extraordinary, and it's nothing like, in style, I think, or very little like what you see in Snows of Kilimanjaro. So, how so? Well, uh, let's be more specific. Um, first, let's talk about the thing that people have cared about so much, point of view. Um, who's speaking here? Who sees? What do we know about the narrator? And what don't we know? What okay, do you think? good. Good way to begin an analysis of this story. What are, how would you respond to those questions? Who's speaking? What do we know about the narrator? And what do we not know? All right. Uh, Bunbury is typing here. Let's see what uh, she has to say. Um, and we, we don't know. What, one of the, the, the first things in that sentence is we don't know why they're not going to the war anymore. Are they... Right. Prevented from going to the war? Have they chosen not to go to the war anymore? Are they prisoners? Are they just deserters? I mean, as it turns out, they're they're um, wounded, but we don't know that at this point. So that's one thing we don't know. We also don't know the the narrator's name. All right, Jennifer writes here. Um, All the talk of game makes it seem like the person should be a hunter. Ah, good point. There's no talk of people. Former soldier seems to have a sense of mood of light and dark. Okay. Yep. Yes, we do know that he's a former soldier. That is true. That is true. Um, but we still don't know why he's not going to the war anymore. It's true, but it, this all depends, of course, on our abilities, our willingness to engage in our abilities at inference. Mm -hmm. um, and, of mm -hmm. course, this is the striking thing about Hemingway. He demands your careful attention and your willingness to infer from your reading. Right. And that is um, that is very suitable to the classroom, of course, um, and it's uh, highly unusual in literary fiction. Almost always somebody gives you enough information to, to know more about the character at the center of the story than Hemingway does here. So, uh -huh. um, for example... We do not know the person's name. We don't know their age. We don't know where they're from. Um, we don't know virtually anything about them. Uh, very little of it, which we will eventually find out. We were going to have to infer these kinds of things. And we Karen, basically... Karen makes a really good point here. Uh, she notes that he is an outsider. He's sign lined. We don't go there anymore. And he's looking in the windows. Um, Bunbury writes the progression of animals uh, mentioned is interesting that I hadn't thought about the progression yeah that that's something to focus on at this point the character could be anyone almost right almost anyone at this point um, we don't even know you know I, I wonder the, the question of gender we at this point we don't know if this is a we assume it's a male but we're not we're not sure about that um, they might be disconnected from people therefore no mention of them but there is that plural we, we don't go to it anymore. So there is a suggestion, I think, of some, some connection. We have uh, more comments coming in. Let's take these and then we'll, we'll move ahead. Um, yeah, I, I think this is all true. Um, we have remarkably little information mm -hmm. about this character in the first paragraph and for the whole first part and for much of the story. And I, I would get even more basic 
one thing we do not know about this person at this point is the person's thoughts. We don't have anything representing their reaction to the experiences they're describing that we cannot get, that we can get in any way other than inference. And this is remarkable. In fact, it's strikingly artificial in a way. And this is the way it would have seemed to Hemingway's contemporaries and still might strike us in the way that you might look at the artifice of modernist painting in a way and say, wow, that looks nothing like the ordinary or conventional or familiar or natural ways to render experience. Right, yeah. We don't they get, say, they, go ahead. We don't get the streets looked dark to me or I saw the window or I saw the window and I thought of home or I saw the foxes and I remembered hunting. All the kinds of things that a more conventional writer would have done here. We have no representation of the ordinary actions of consciousness, in other words. The very things in which literary narrative had been deepening, or the very things to which literary nar narrative had been deepening its attention for virtually a century, the interior workings of the subjective mm -hmm. mind. Mm -hmm. um, we have, and yeah, go ahead. Dave Faden makes a similar point. He says, it seems like the first sentence of the second paragraph puts them in the hospital the reason they aren't going. What strikes me is the fact that they're in Milan as a contrast with the hospital. I think what you're saying here, Sean, is that if, if, if you know, some time ago, if somebody, you know, 100 years before or 50 years before or two weeks before Hemingway wrote this, somebody would have said, you know, we were in Milan in the hospital. Right. The, the hospital, as it turns out, is the setting for the story, and it's that's the reason they're not going to the war anymore. And yet here in the opening, he doesn't tell you he's in the hospital. Right. The, the large fact of his life that he's wounded and in the hospital is omitted here. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Then the wind um, repeated, life is passing him or her by. Uh, and then um, could the game represent a presence of death? Yes, I think that's probably true. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think very, that's very good comments. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's all true. But um, before even getting to those thematic intimations, let me just draw attention to the technique that makes them so powerful. So one thing we might just note about it is, and this is what I mean by saying almost no English teacher would tell somebody to write this way. They would say, don't write this way. Um, what If you just look at the verb forms, one thing you might note here is uh, an incredible repetition of the, the use of to be. In fact, all of early Hemingway's fiction over well, overflowing with to be verbs. And then other kinds of generic, very simple verbs. So here, was, go, came, was, was. Uh, to the extent we get more distinctive predication in this paragraph, it is verbs that you might even think of as being not too far away from to be verbs. Blue, blue, came, turned, hung. Um, None of these things are actually quite in the passive voice, but they feel like the passive voice because, of course, they all emphasize the agency of larger forces on vulnerable or, or weak creatures. The wind blows the tails of the dead animals. The wind comes down. The wind turns the feathers of the birds. The birds are blown, etc. So You know what strikes, what strikes me about this, Sean, is that You've got so much repetition there. You've got um, yep. wind like uh, uh, four times or so in the last uh, three sentences. It it doesn't it doesn't strike the ear as repetition. No. I mean, this is not heavy, dull language. He must have really worked hard to get the cadence right. Yeah, yeah. This is what Wallace Stevens means by calling him a lyric poet. I think that a cadence yeah. and rhythm become very important to creating the the sense not of repetition but of of something like lyric, you know. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, let me ask a, a more philosophical kind of question. If we think about this as a rendition of character or maybe even more basically a rendition of consciousness, what kind of consciousness is being suggested? That is what kind of operation of the mind is represented by this kind of syntax? Okay, what kind of operation of the mind is represented by this kind of syntax? A really, a really good question. We'd already talked about a consciousness that, that sort of um, sticks to the surface, 
Uh, and let's see, Siga is uh, writing in. Let's see what her comment is. A really good question to pose to your students. Uh, I'm sure you'd get some interesting responses. Although it's uh, pretty abstract, so um, let me um, let me try and make it more concrete by referring okay. to a contrast. Um, so here is um, Stephen Crane, uh, a writer that uh, Hemingway greatly admired. Um, uh, Hemingway famously said that Crane and um, Mark Twain were the two fathers of modern literature, uh, and a writer uh, whose impressionist style um, Hemingway can see, be seen in some ways to continue, uh, and whose impressionist style can be seen as typical of some of his friends in the literary world, Henry James, Joseph Conrad uh, in particular, Kate Chopin perhaps. So if you look at this paragraph and think about it by comparison to Hemingway, what might you say is the difference? Two rivers of people swarmed along the sidewalks, spattered with black mud, which made each shoe leave a scar-like impression. Overhead elevated trains with a shrill grinding of the wheels stopped at the station, which upon its leg-like pillars seemed to resemble some monstrous kind of crab squatting over the street. The quick, fat puffings of the engine could be heard. Down an alley, there were somber curtains of purple and black on which street lamps dully glittered like embroidered flowers. Wow, that's an awesome paragraph, but it's not Hemingway. So uh, what's the difference? So, yeah, so much more complex um, language, of course. Richard, are you still there? I can't hear you. Um, well, let me, uh, let me ask, can you hear me? Are, are people hearing me? Yeah, the iceberg, iceberg is above the water. Oh, oh thank you very much. Okay, so, uh, um, yes, a personification, um, absolutely. A personification in particular, I would say, um, through the operation of simile. Um, so uh, lamps dully glittered like embroidered flowers. Um, that's not quite personification. I guess it's flowerification. Um, but you get that kind of thing all the way throughout. Um, each shoe leaves a scar-like impression. Uh, the, the L station is like a monstrous kind of crab. So uh, lots and lots of really striking and elaborate similes is one of the techniques that's going to become prominent in modernist writing. You could think you might think of T.S. Eliot, for example, or Raymond Chandler uh, as striking examples. What that, of course, creates, or what we might think if we, if we pause to consider for a moment, what that might create as a rendition of conscious, we, we might note, is the operation of the poetic mind. That is, somebody is looking at the world and drawing an analogy in order to reinforce the intensity of the experience to the poetic mind. Somebody has said, the station looks like a crab. Somebody thinks the, the lamps are like flowers. So we see the mind in operation. And this is um, what Hemingway is not showing us. That is, we don't get any figure speech here, no explicit figures of speech, no similes, no metaphors. Um, and we have very little to go, let me just go back. We have very little in the way of predication of verbs, in other words, that show the working of the mind in identifying features of the world and picking them out and saying, this is what is distinctively happening here. This is what this is distinctively as an item. Um, rather, the implication is, or I think the in intention is to create something like a kind of pure impressionism in a kind of um, reductive empiricism, that is just the evidence of the sentences, senses before cognition, before con con conscious thought, before things have been put into packages, in other words. There is, uh, in this respect, uh, something a little bit artificial about what Hemingway is doing. Uh, I think intentionally artificial, that is, Nobody probably really experiences the world in this way. That is, you don't walk out and just have things strike your eyeball without having associations about them, thoughts, memories, concepts, in, in order to make them meaningful. But the goal of this kind of writing is to write as if you did, 
as if to give you the kind of experience you have before you begin to put it into packages, before your mind begins to make sense of it. It's a little bit uh, like um, some recent experience, experiments um, in social psychology which are designed to capture, say, implicit bias. So uh, if you want to illustrate the action of implicit bias uh, in, in social psychology, one thing you do is to try and cap capture people's thinking before they have begun to tame it through their sense of, how, of what behavior is appropriate, um, before they conceptualize it, in effect. Um, so you design experiments to capture uh, how much attention an eyeball gives to a particular image, uh, or what words immediately spring to mind if an image is shown. Hemingway is doing something similar here, I think, in rendering a consciousness for us before it gets to conceptual awareness. Something. Um, Richard, by the way, uh, if you can hear me, I cannot hear you. I, I don't know um, if I've lost contact here, or, um, but I'm, I'm assuming that you all can still hear me. So um, something similar we might note um, uh, about word choice. Um, if we look at the paragraph again and think not about um, uh, syntax, that is, the construction of the sentences and the verbs being used, but we think about the words being employed, um, what would you know here? In the fall, the war was always there, but we did not go to it anymore. It was cold in the fall in Milan, and the dark came very early. Then the electric lights came on, and it was pleasant along the streets looking in the windows. There was much game hanging outside the shops, and the snow pattered in the fur of the foxes, and the wind blew their tails, etc. Um, talks about word choice here. Okay, I'm not here. I'm not. Oh, I see. Some people are typing. Uh, one or two simple syllables. Yes, very simple words, of course. So simple, absolutely. Um, I, as a a a person who teaches uh, English and who works with students on their writing, um, one of the things that I would note about this, and that I think most English teachers would, um, they would bring out their blue pens or red pens and start circling with, um, is simply repetition. Um, of course, very simple words, uh, and the same words used again and again. This has powerful thematic implications, that is, we know what the story is about if we're reading carefully. Um, but it also, again, I think the idea is creates something like an impression of simple consciousness or precognitive awareness of the world. But that's kind of abstract. So let's why don't we turn to the thematic implications of the story? Uh, Hemingway famously said about this kind of writing later on, uh, "I found the greatest difficulty aside from knowing truly what you really felt rather than what you were supposed to feel." Um, almost as if in experiments in social psychology, that is, psychology wants to test for your implicit bias, not what you want to say about yourself, but the way you actually think. Hemingway similarly says, Look, I want to render what I truly feel, not what I'm supposed to feel in the, in the world of acceptable opinion. Um, in doing this, he says, what you've got to do is put down what really happened in action, what the actual things were which produced the emotion that you experienced, the real thing the sequence of motion and fact which made the emotion, which would be as valid in a year or in 10 years. There you see, by the way, that idea of enduring experience by being put through careful literary craftsmanship. Um, but if you think about um, uh, what the emotion is that is being conveyed here, um, what would we say? That is, what are the thematic implications of this paragraph? What is the emotion that Hemingway might expect to be conveyed by this rendition of experience. Okay, I've tried, I've tried to come back in. Can, oh, okay, great. I'm so sorry. No okay, Th thanks for carrying on, Sean. Uh, no problem. So uh, let me let me just pose the question more um, specifically. Why is this a good paragraph to open the story? Although it tells us virtually nothing about who the the narrator is. Uh, and about um, what his thoughts and feelings are. Nevertheless, mm -hmm. if we read 
with attention and for inference or for implication, if we infer implication, um, we will have a strong sense of what is going on here. And this is, of course, the kind of thing that you can say to your students. What do we know just from this paragraph um, without having much other information? An excellent way to begin any kind of lesson on uh, fiction. Okay, so we've got some folks writing. What I was going to say before I lost my sound uh, <clears throat> with regard to the passage you put up on the screen about Stephen Crane, the similes there lead us to meaning. I mean, those similes convey you know, the, the meaning that he wants us to get. When you take away all of those similes, that goes back to the point you made about the importance of inference uh, when we read Hemingway. We don't have those cues, those simile cues, and those meta the figurative language cues. Uh, the, 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 the author isn't leading us to uh, meaning where he's leaving us on our own. Okay, um, Ernst, Ernest writes, I don't know uh, that there is much emotion yet, and that may be the part of the point. Yes, pleasant is pretty generic. Uh, Hemingway's writing engages the reader and forces them to make inferences, right? I always thought they, that second, um, third sentence, the electric lights came on and it was pleasant along the streets looking in the windows. That always struck me as, as um, uh, the electric lights, they're, you, they're, they push against the darkness, they suggest warmth. I mean, this is a person who's looking, I think, for some emotional, some consolation amidst this cold and these uh, emblems of death, and as we later learn, his own close uh, association with death, his, his uh, own uh, uh, escape. Um, let's yeah. see. It throws you directly into the feeling of loneliness. Yep. Uh, in the line, in the the line that strikes me most is the description of the deer being stiff and heavy and empty. Good, good insight. Yeah. They are the heaviest words, perhaps. Yeah, and I always like what struck me about this too was that the verb powdered. That is a perfect verb for that sentence. You can see the snow powdering on the fur, not going deep into the fur, just just gently covering. The, the edges uh, of, the, uh, of the individual hairs. Yeah. There's a, a, a famous line in uh, the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas where Gertrude Stein uh, quotes Hemingway. I, I believe it's the only place that this uh, sentiment is quoted. And so it may not be reliable, but it seems illuminating nevertheless. Um, Stein, who at this point is not an admirer of Hemingway any longer, probably because he's gone on to greater fame and success than she did, um, but Stein quotes Hemingway saying, I found out that I could turn my flame very low uh, and then there would be an explosion. Mm. She suggests there that it's a, a little bit of a trick, but it's not a bad description of what he does. That is, through the very minimal diction, little, virtually no distinctive predication, repetition of word choice, great simplicity. When there is something that, stand, that is unusual in that context, boy, does it stand out. So powdered maybe the most distinctive verb in the whole paragraph, and it makes a striking yeah. impression, therefore. Yeah, I would say, yeah. uh, like you, Richard, that I, I think the intimation here uh, that you get from the repetition of cold and dark and blue and came, I think it's, well, it's a little Game of Thronesy, I suppose. Uh, winter is coming. The mm -hmm. dark is coming on. Death is in the air. Uh, yeah. Dead, heavy, empty deer. Uh, it's all intimation of mortality to reverse Wordsworth. Um, and the electric light, I think the suggestion is this tiny little uh, brief wall against the darkness. And setting us up perhaps to, to see the electrical machines that are going to work on the men's bodies later on as something like that. That is a false bulwark against the coming darkness. Right, None right. None of this is said explicitly, um, but it's all there for us to infer, and that is, I think Hemingway would want to believe implicit in the rendition of this motion and fact, that we will, if we are reading this in the right sympathy, we will experience the moment as the character does. That is, I think, a young mind confronting the reality of death and wishing to keep it at bay and knowing that it cannot be kept at bay. Yeah, and the stories resonate among themselves. I mean, this resonates with A Way You'll Never Be, 
which again, and it also resonates with a clean, well-lighted place. I mean, those electric lights yeah. pushing against the darkness. Yeah, he really did yeah. teach us how to read his uh, his fiction. Well, we could move on. We've got about fifteen minutes. Sure. Okay, so let's talk about. I would say the killers. Also, the killers tells a similar mm -hmm. story. That is, right. a young boy encountering the reality of death and thinking, like, what do you do about that? Some people are just going to ignore it. Um, this is George's rent, uh, uh, advice to Nick. If I were you, I wouldn't think about it. Um, but there uh, is going to be a more serious problem for the Hemingway protagonist. How do you respond to this intimation of mortality? So uh, these are those are some of the, the ways, I think, just in that opening paragraph, you might think about Hemingway doing remarkable things with diction, uh, with the simplicity and repetition of his verb choice and his word selection, and with point of view, the way in which we get a first-person consciousness but without cognitive or without explicit thinking involved. Um, very unusual. Something similar in the kinds of point of view and the use of dialogue we get in fiction from around the same era like um, Hills Like White Elephants. So let's do a similar thing here and think what do we know about these people um, just from what we've gotten here and what are we not getting? So uh, uh, I'm going to um, pick up here I, uh, so late in the story of Hills Like well, White Elephants. Uh, one character says, would you do something for me now? I'll do anything for you. Would you please, 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 please stop talking? He did not say anything but looked at the bags against the wall of the station. There were labels on them from all the hotels where they had spent nights. But I don't want you to, he said. I don't care anything about it. Slightly later, I better take the bags over to the other side of the station, the man said. She smiled at him. All right, then come back and we'll finish the beer. He picked up the two heavy bags and carried them around the station to the other tracks. He looked up the tracks but could not see the train. Coming back, he walked to the bar room where people waiting for the train were drinking. He drank an anise at the bar and looked at the people. They were all waiting reasonably for the train. He went out to the bead curtain. She was sitting at the table and smiled at him. Do you feel better? He asked. I feel fine, she said. There's nothing wrong with me. I feel fine. So um, what do we see? What point of view do we have? What do we not see? What point of view are we not given? What information are, not we, are we not given? What do we know about these people solely from the dialogue here? One thing to note about this, by the way, while you are typing or thinking, is that the reliance on dialogue alone is remarkable. Um, that is the extent to which this story in particular and many Hemingway stories feature dialogue, make the narrative driven by dialogue. So that in this particular case, virtually everything we know comes from quoted direct speech. That in and of itself, very unusual. Um, the person who in some ways is the, well, if you think back to that Stephen Crane story, no dialogue in the paragraph I gave you there. And in that story, there are a few lines of meaningless dialogue. What we importantly get, we get from the narrator's perspective. Henry James, likewise. Uh, James uh, remarkably scoffed at dialogue, suggested that when a writer was engaging in dialogue, it was a kind of laziness um, that a that a better writer is giving you the important information through the narrator's voice. So okay. uh, as, as uh, Denise says, um, this is a classic Hemingway opening of a man and woman not getting along. Yeah, <laughs> that is what it's about, of course. Um, and of course, the amazing thing about the story, in addition to all this, is the fact that we know what they're arguing about, although they never say what they're arguing about. The fact that people can have a disagreement where they never express the subject of their disagreement, this is, of course, something we know, the ability to talk around something. But as far as I know, this is one of the very first literary renditions of that common fact of experience, of a dialogue that doesn't give you what it's about in the words that are said. Mm -hmm. But he, he, I mean, as we read the story, we, we can figure out what, what we, we think we can figure out what's going on. And the key, the, the one sentence here that suggests uh, what might be going on is when the man says, but I don't want you to, he said, I don't care anything about it. That <clears throat> in this passage that's on the screen, that 
that's completely out of place. It's, it's you know, who knows what they're saying. But in the, in the entire context of the story, that, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. Right. Of course, famously, this is a story about abortion in which mm -hmm. abortion is never actually mentioned. A child is never actually mentioned. We have to figure out, of course, what they are arguing about. And we have to figure out why they're arguing about it. Yeah. We have to figure out what it means when the man looks at the bags. Um, he did not say anything but looked at the bags against the wall of the station. There were labels on them from all of the hotels where they had spent nights. And here's an example of something like what Gertrude Stein might call the explosion. That is, we have almost no rendition of the point of view of the character. We know what they say, but not what they see. Here, in this moment, the narrative pauses to say, this is what he is noticing, the bags against the wall of the station. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What does that tell us? Uh, they're, well, obviously, they're in a rail station. They're traveling. Um, also, on those bags, you have all of the labels of the hotels where they spent nights. Now, we don't know if this is a married couple or not, but obviously, they have spent nights together. That's going to yes. loom large in the story. Uh, right. Um, uh, Ernest, Ernest writes, uh, isn't that the phrase where they spent nights? Kind of curious. Yes, it is kind of curious. Yeah. Suggests <laughs> volumes. The motivation of the story, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, uh, he, uh, you know, he wants to move those bags. He's been looking for the train. He wants to move along. He wants to get out of there. Seems to me. Yeah, I, I think exactly. That's exactly right. Uh, we know, of course, from this that they are expatriates. That's a, um, a kind of given of the story, but we do have to infer it from the information the story gives us. Uh, and we know that they've been living abroad and they've been traveling. They're tourists. Um, we know that this man is going to be carrying those bags and that they're heavy. He's got some baggage that he's carrying, yeah. um, literally. Um, but I, I think the intimation here is he is seeing what he will have to give up. Uh, there is a woman and a man speaking here. Uh, the man is bullying the woman into um, having an abortion. One thing you see here, remarkably, for a Hemingway story, is that um, the rendition of the man is, I believe, not very sympathetic. He looks like a bully uh, and a weak man. Um, but we also see, I think, here the suggestion of something that Hemingway genuinely did care about, um, which is that uh, this is part of perhaps what he would think of as the frailty of human bodies they reproduce. Um, sex leads to pregnancy, leads to children, leads to leaving your life in Europe behind. It leads to no more nights in hotels. Um, it leads to nights with babysitters and diapers, uh, etc. Um, and all of this is kind of just suggested, I believe, in the moment that he looks over at the bags where he, the, the intimation is he's seeing what's at issue in the fight for him. Mm -hmm. They are going to lose their expatriate lifestyle. Yeah. We have to read very carefully to see these things. Uh, another thing we might note here, by the way, is if we go down to that lower last paragraph, we can see that, um, as Richard suggested earlier, he's looking to get away. So one thing we've seen is that the woman says, he says, I'll take the bags over the other side of the station. The woman says, come back. We'll finish the beer. Uh, and we know that when he comes back, he pauses and gets a drink in the bar. Um, he drank in Anissa at the bar and looked at the people. Um, so we know uh, that he is not rushing back to finish that beer. He's going to pause and have a drink on his own. And that speaks volumes, of course. Well, the thing they know also. Yep, go ahead. The, the thing that's baffled me about this is the word reasonably. They were all uh, waiting yeah. reasonably for the train. Well, yeah, I mean, why does he tell us they were reasonable about waiting for the train? I, I, I couldn't <laughs> figure that one out. Yeah, here we go. Sigger writes. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, we see great minds think alike, Sigger here. They were all waiting reasonably for the train. I thought that was a curious phrase. Yeah. I think the, the, the reason that's there is because this story is a great... And if you are at all sympathetic to it, a, a kind of heart-wrenching rendition of what it is like to be in a fight with somebody you love, to be married and to be fighting, uh, and the sense that you might have in that situation, uh, as it could be especially exacerbated by being in a foreign country, the sense that you have of being utterly alone in the world, of being surrounded by people who are not like you, as you mm -hmm. and your partner are unreasonable. You are caught up in all of the unreasonability of the world. And then you look at the people around you. I think in Hemingway's tradition, it's, this is like looking at the peasants. You see people who are uh, integrated into their lives. 
who are experiencing the um, unfamiliarities or the familiarities of late trains and not getting excited about it. And seeing that and knowing how far you are away from that is yeah, the yeah. suggestion of the story. Yeah, all hung on one word, great. Well, shall we move ahead? Um, sure, yeah. Um, so uh, same kind of thing we could do with the very beginning of the story. Um, this is, I cut off the first few sentences, I guess, but these are the opening lines uh, or the opening paragraph. Uh, it was very hot and the express from Barcelona would come in 40 minutes. It stopped at this junction for two minutes and went on to Madrid. What should we drink? The girl asked. She had taken off her hat and put it on the table. It's pretty hot, the man said. Let's drink beer. Dos cervezas, the man said into the curtain. Big ones? A woman asked from the doorway. Yes, two big ones. The woman brought two glasses of beer and two felt pads. She put the felt pads and the beer glasses on the table and looked at the man and the girl. The girl was looking off at the line of hills. They were white in the sun and the country was brown and dry. They look like white elephants, she said. I've never seen one, the man drank his beer. No, you wouldn't have. I might have, the man said. Just because you say I wouldn't have doesn't prove anything. Um, so uh, what do we know just from this opening? Okay, what do we know? Karen has offered us an interesting comment on the word reasonably. Their argument has pretenses toward reason, but it is not based on reason. Yes. That's yeah, exactly. very insightful. So he envies their, uh, he envies them, their reason, the, uh, the people at the bar. Yeah, that's I, excellent interpretation. Yeah, I think, I, I think, I don't know if I, if I'm certain of envy, but I, I would say I think that the pathos has to be, the pathos comes from knowing that that is not who the characters are, mm -hmm. having the sense that you are not the reasonable ones. You might look at that as envy and say, oh, they have a better life than I do or a happier life than I do. You also might look at it with what I think Hemingway probably prefers, a kind of tragic sensibility. That is, they lead simple, natural lives. I am tormented, where the torment is uh, what is important. Sort of like it snows of Kilimanjaro, where Harry's wife wants him to survive, and Harry thinks, I am rotting, and I'm, my experience is disappearing because I sold it all away where there's something noble about that suffering. Um, is well, the girl owns the story? Yes, she is. Going back to our other question, what do we know about these people? It seems that one of the tensions may be that the, the girl, uh, or the guy, thinks that the girl feels that he, she is superior to him. Um, yeah. They look like white elephants. I've never seen one. No, you wouldn't have. Well, I might have, the man said, just because you say I wouldn't have doesn't prove anything. Um, he seems to be perhaps striving for a little sophistication, which uh, uh, refers me back to the way he orders the beer. He uses Spanish, and the woman who responds, responds in English. Uh, yeah, though I'm not sure that we know that. I think that um, I think we see a, a kind of... A, classic Hemingway little technique here, a little mm -hmm. trick, where first we have it rend rendered in Spanish and then we have a, a kind of literal translation ah. uh, of the Spanish uh -huh. uh, given to us. Yeah, so I think, yeah. yes, to, and, to and they, they, the, the women, the... sorry, go, no, go ahead. I, I was gonna say, I, I think to emphasize, yes, the, signif the sophistication of the man and their foreignness in this world. Mm -hmm. I would just also... Yeah, and the woman... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I, would, I would say that we don't even have to get very far to know about these characters. We're going to be able to, to find out a lot from the lines about the hills, like, like, like White Elephant say. But if you just look at the first exchange, what should we drink, the girl asked. Uh, it's pretty hot, the man said. Let's drink beer. I think you automatically know something about them there. It is, I think we know that the woman is going to take the lead here. Um, unusually, surprisingly, the story shows that a Hemingway-like man looking kind of weak and pathetic and defensive. Um, more strikingly below, but from the first, the woman is the provocateur of the conversation here. Um, 
but her provocation comes in the form of a question. So we have, I think, sort of like what happens in, um, in another country, something like the illusion of agency. That is, the woman asking the question, but it being a question. And the man being manipulative, frankly. That is, we, I think the suggestion is here is that he knows what he wants them to drink, but he doesn't want to ask for it. So he says, mm -hmm. it's pretty hot. And then she says, oh, you want beer. Let's drink beer. So I think the idea here is that this is, in a way, a kind of subtle and striking rendition of sexual inequality in marriage. That is, we see that the man is in control of this relationship, uh, but that the woman gets an illusion of some kind of control about which the man must be defensive and which he wishes to conceal from both of them, so that he tries to manipulate her into doing what he wants. Mm -hmm. And this is, of course, all a precursor to the discovery, which we must infer, that he's trying to manipulate her into getting an abortion mm -hmm. uh, over her resistance. Yeah, and uh, Ernest Denise Bunbury writes, uh, I think she has a different kind of vision. He talks into the curtains and she looks off into the hills. He does seem fairly pedestrian and she, um, she, is, she can think artistically. She uses a simile. They look like white elephants. He doesn't see that. Yeah, exactly so. Yeah, I think that's the suggestion, yeah, that she has a kind of poetic sensibility that he lacks here. I, 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 knowing the Hemingway style, I think we might say, oh, there's probably some ambivalence about this. That is, this might look for a Hemingway character or for a Hemingway narrator uh, a little bit too poetic. Um, and this is what the woman is calling him on. That is, you willfully lack the imagination. Maybe you willfully lack the imagination to see us leading a decent and free life with a child in the future. You're mm -hmm. not going to allow for that to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think, uh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Ernest uh, uh, Bunbury, Bunbury writes, uh, that would make her more at ease in this difficult um, and stressful situation. Do you feel that's, that's uh, accurate? Well, I do think that it's, it, that it's striking here that Hemingway shows us um, a, a dialogue in which we can see sexual inequality dramatized. We can see a bad conscience about sexual inequality. We can see mm -hmm. the weakness and defensiveness of the man. And we can see uh, the, the confidence of a sort uh, and the autonomy and the judgment of the woman. Uh, as genuinely sexist as Hemingway may be, uh, this is a story in which he allows us to see all of the ways, or some of the ways, some of the powerful ways in which that might be indicted and in which we can share, almost share the perspective of somebody doing the indicting. And I would say, that being the woman in the story, and I would say, yes, that, uh, that in Hemingway's thinking about this, the woman is asking for a kind of comfort in life. Uh, there's another striking Hemingway story from this era um, called Cat in the Rain, where uh, a very similarly situated young woman says to a, a man, uh, I want to have a cat. I want to have a nice table. I want to grow out my hair. Um, I, I want to, she's in effect saying, I want to go home. I want the comforts of home. I'm tired of living the bohemian life of Europe. I want comforts. I want a family. Uh, and of course, the, the male protagonist wants none of these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we must, again, I, just to reiterate, we must infer all these things, but they are there to be inferred. And it is just a, a fail-safe classroom exercise to give this kind of thing to students and say, all right, figure it out. Who are these people? What do we know about them? What are they arguing about? What are they saying? What are they not saying, et cetera? Okay. True. Sorry, go ahead. I, I was you finish finish your point, Sean, please. Uh, that's it. I'm finished. Okay, well we have uh, I think you have one more uh, one more slide with some questions on it that our teachers might consider there. Um, uh, oh, and then the killers. Yeah, why don't we why don't we focus on this? Okay, do we still have time for this? Yeah, well we're a little over, but it's no no problem. I think people will stick with us. Okay. So um, that is classic Hemingway dialogue. Um, so to the killers, um, uh, classic Hemingway dialogue. In, in keeping with all of the things that we've been noting, um, among the striking things you might uh, observe about this is how little we have in the way of 
the introduction and qualification of the quoted, the direct speech. So um, no, he's, or very little in the way of, he said sharply, he shouted, he inquired. Um, to the extent that things are introduced, uh, it's usually the equivalent of to be, that is something like he said, she said, mm -hmm. uh, as minimal diction as you can get, and quite frequently none of that at all. So in hills like white elephants, almost no he said and she said, and here in the killers as well, as much as possible of just direct speech. So uh, here's uh, young Nick Adams, who has come to see Ole Anderson, saying, couldn't you fix it up some way? No, I got in wrong. He talked in the same flat voice. There ain't anything to do. After a while, I'll make up my mind to go out. I better go back and see George, Nick said. So long, said Ole Anderson. He did not look toward Nick. Thanks for coming around. Nick went out. As he shut the door, he saw Ole Anderson with all his clothes on, lying on the bed, looking at the wall. He's been in his room all day, the landlady said downstairs. I guess he don't feel well. I said to him, Mr. Anderson, you ought to go out and take a walk on a nice fall day like this. But he didn't feel like it. He doesn't want to go out. I'm sorry he don't feel well, the woman said. He's an awfully nice man. He was in the ring, you know. I know it. You'd never know it except from the way his face is, the woman said. They stood talking just inside the street door. He's just as gentle. Well, good night, Mrs. Hirsch, Nick said. So same kind of Hemingway dialogue. Um, what does it show us? Um, what do we know about Ole Anderson from what he says to Nick? Um, how might we compare the relations among the characters in the scene to those uh, that were, are set up with our initial encounter with Max and Al or, between, or with those among Nick, George, and Sam? Um, let me go back to that slide. Uh, any thoughts? What do we know here from this dialogue? Hey, what do we know? Do we know? Oh, we know that he was in the fights. Oh, he was in the fights. Yeah. That he's gentle. We can't tell except that he was in the fights except for his face. We know that Mrs. Hirsch was trying to take care of him. What else do we know? Yeah. We have some people typing in. Let's see. I would note a, another falling and vulnerable body. Um, right. Ray Anderson is lying down. We don't, from this from this uh, dialogue on the screen, we don't know why Nick is there. We don't know their relationship. Um, there is, by the way, a great movie adaptation of the story um, starring Burt Lancaster and the very young Ava Gardner. Um, I, among her first movies, maybe. Uh, this, and the story has very little to do with, the story of the movie has very little to do with Emily's story, but it does show you Burt Lancaster as Ole lying down. And it's really a striking, striking scene. It's a great yeah. movie, too. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, Ava Gardner, a good North Carolinian from nearby Smithfield. Yeah, what a uh, bombshell she's in that yeah, too. I, I know. There's a museum to, to her. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we have Siga uh, writing in. Let's see. The fight has gone out of him. Ah, good point. He's, la he's laying down. Yeah. Yes. Fight's over, yeah. yeah. So, and in this respect, he's a lot like the major, of course, in, in another country. That is, the, the basic scenario you get in a lot of these stories is the young person's encounter, especially the young man's encounter, the young man's encounter with an older figure who is introducing him to the inevitable reality mm -hmm. of death. Mm -hmm. It's coming. Sooner or later, it's coming. There's no getting away from it. You might as well look at the wall. I would say... Um, uh, I would say also that uh, um, that what matters in the story in general are relationships, curiously. Uh, that there's a relationship between Nick and Oli here, and it's created for us by contrast to the re relationship between Max and Al, um, who are foreigners to this world, of course, um, and those between Nick and George and Sam. And all we know, the only way we know about this relationship existing is from the words that Oli says. Thanks for coming around. As despite the fact that this man knows he is soon to be executed and has given up, he takes the time to offer a tiny courtesy to somebody who is trying to do him a kindness. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all ineffectual, it's all pointless, and yet nevertheless I think the suggestion is it matters. Uh, that there's some decency about this person that is not evident in Max and Al, 
or maybe even in George himself. Well, with that, ladies and gentlemen, let's bring our seminar to an end. It does matter that we, we wrap up reasonably on time. So let me ask, are there any final questions, any last shots before we wrap things up this evening? And Sean, while we're waiting for people to respond, let me thank you doubly, first of all, for putting up with our technical problems last week, but also agreeing to do the seminar this week and for giving us an excellent program. I've been reading Hemingway for decades, and what this has taught me is to turn the, 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 the fine, uh, fine tuning of my microscope, my interpretive microscope, down even finer to look at many, many more details. Thank you very much. This was a great webinar. Well, thank you all very much. Um, I uh, very much appreciate your patience in coming back and um, your patience in listening to me yammer on about this for a while. It, um, it was a pleasure for me. So, thank you. And I want to thank our participants for their, their intelligent, enthusiastic participation this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, next week, 7 p.m. on the 25th, we're going to take up Toni Morrison's novel, The Bluest Eye. I hope you will join us for that. Again, thank you for joining us this evening, and good night.